Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura. I'm your co-host for this episode. And, you know, today I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to be sharing uh, with my, my viewers uh, a, a, a situation that I hope a lot of you aren't experiencing, but I'm hearing, you know, anecdotally that this is kind of like an epi epidemic that we are having disruptive board meetings and disruptive board meetings, which means where the owners will take kind of take over the meeting to the point where you know, the board can't finish its business. And uh, I am sad to uh, tell you that my my board is is you know we had one of those, and uh, I went to, and then we decided you know we, we had we had to get our business done, and because you know you know we we were able to do that. I thought, well, maybe other boards are having the same situation. And my guest, uh, and thank you, Rachel Glanstein, for being my guest today. Rachel Glanstein is a um, professional uh, registered uh, parliamentarian, and uh, she was the one who fixed our meetings and brought order to disorder uh, because my 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 meeting in September of this year was so bad that we couldn't, uh, the owners were so disruptive, yelling and screaming and and wouldn't let us, uh, wouldn't let us get a, a word in edgewise. We had to cancel our meeting. And I think it was because there was a resolution on the agenda and the, the resolution was, uh, 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 we were uh, to adopt a policy of no harassment or micromanagement of condominium employees and vendors and this was based on a complaint that our board got from a vendor that a board member was micromanaging his employees and you know which is very very serious and those of you who sit on boards uh know that you know a board the association is the employer and so the board is the one who takes action on behalf of the association and that means that if a complaint comes to you as the uh, employer, and those of you who are in the private sector and work in management know this, hostile work environment and micromanagement, you know that those are words that bring terror to management because you know you're gonna get sued. And those, you know, you end up paying a whole lot of money or your insurance company pays a whole lot of money, you know, to, to resolve those claims. And so that's why we did the 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 um the the resolution which we ran by our general counsel who said that was fine I mean all we were doing was adopting a policy where the board would say we have zero tolerance and 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 the upshot of it you know what we said in the the resolution basically is that owners or board members engage in this type of conduct the board is not going to tolerate it we're going to turn it right over to legal and let the lawyers handle it and we're not going to get, you know, deal with it. And that's what, and, and I think what happened is we had maybe 15 or 20 owners. That may not seem like a lot of, a lot of people, but we usually have 10 people, maybe, yeah, maybe 10 people at our board meeting. And so if you get 15 or 20 people and they're all yelling at you, uh, you know, that can be very disruptive. Uh, of course, they were saying that, no, we, we we were telling them that they had no right. If they wanted to tell an employee how to do their work, that they had every right to do so because they were owners and they paid their salaries. And and this is, I mean, and 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 this is what they were telling us. They they you know they wouldn't stop. They you know no matter how much I pounded my gavel, so I terminated the meeting. And in all and I and in executive session, my board said, "Well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do?" And I says, "Well, I the only thing I can think of is I'm going to call uh, Steve Blanstein because he's the parliamentarian that I always deal with." And I'm going to ask him if he could assist us. You know, he, he we, he's, the only time I think that we've ever used him is we had an issue with trying to terminate, a, you know, a board member or, you know, and so we very seldom, I don't think we very seldom used Steve or we had an issue at an annual meeting. But when I called him, uh, Steve was not available. So we had Rachel, his daughter. And so I wanted to share with you people out there, if you have boards and you're having disruptive board meetings, and Rachel is here to answer your questions on how 
you can bring order to disorder. So thank you, Rachel, for being with us today. Uh, can you tell people, I mean, what is it, I mean, what is it that a parliamentarian does? Uh, my favorite, my favorite explanation on what a parliamentarian does is, is what I used to tell kids. I get to tell people what to do and usually they do it. But really what a parliamentarian is, is they're an expert on rules of order and running meetings. So there's different levels of credentialing and education that a parliamentarian can receive. I personally belong to the National Association of Parliamentarians. They're the largest parliamentary organization in the United States. And they have a couple levels. You can just be a member, which means you're interested in studying parliamentary procedure. You could become a registered parliamentarian which means that you're an expert on the current edition of Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised. And you can work to study to become a professional registered parliamentarian. And that you have to prove your skills in serving as a parliamentarian, a presiding officer, a teacher, an author of parliamentary opinions, and a bylaws consultant. That we also do continuing education for as well. And, you know, I know you helped us with our board meeting. Do you do, uh, do you work for any, you know, do you work for people other than community associations? So I will say a majority of my business is condominium associations, but I do also serve community associations and sometimes just general corporations. I've served a couple unions, a couple churches, and occasionally an individual will hire us to serve as a, what's termed a floor parliamentarian to assist them from an aud the audience at a meeting. And I, I and I know from you know just it, uh, talking to to your dad Steve that this usually is a it, is a situation where you have owners who 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 have looked at the uh you know the the five fourteen b statute and they know how to uh uh, uh remove board members. And I think that's what they they hire you for because that that is a very complicated procedure. And I know you know for owners it's kind of scary because you know it might be the first time they've ever done it, and so they want somebody to basically guide them and you know be there in case you know they do something wrong. And I know that that might be one of the situations where you guys are called to uh, assist somebody who is an owner and be a floor person, right? You're right. It's often for removals. Occasionally, there's been a time where an owner just wanted to make sure that a certain motion was reflected in the minutes or a certain point of order was made. But most of the time when we're hired to be in the audience, it's to remove one or more board members. Yeah, because that is a complicated process. And I know, you know, I've been involved in in in, in helping, you know, owners and, and been, you know, the person that's in the audience helping them. And, you know, I try to let them do most of the talking, but, you know, sometimes, I mean, they've never done it before, you know, so sometimes I'm the spokesperson and, 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 uh, you know, so, so, you know, I, I, I do know that, you know, there are owners out there who, who would be requesting uh, services from parliamentarians uh, to help them in doing that. But, you know, and, and, and you, you took over our October meeting. So, so exactly what is the process? I mean, the board will hire you. And you you come to the meeting, and as board chair, the first order of business is I ask the board to appoint you as temporary chair, right? So for running board meetings, yep, exactly. Because state law, for, for community associations and condominium associations, state law provides owners with the right to attend and even to participate in their board's meetings. And so some owners get this idea that that means that they can make motions and vote, et cetera. However, that's why they elect a board. They elect a board to make decisions on their behalf. And if you look at their bylaws, every set of bylaws I've read for a condominium association states that all the power is given to the board except things that are specifically reserved for the owners, such as electing members to the board, removing members from the board, amending the governing documents. Pretty much everything else is a board power. But owners, uh, good and bad, want to be involved. So the state law says, okay, you can be involved, you can attend your board meetings and participate. But again, it's the board 
that is running the meeting. It's the board that has to take action. And as Jane pointed out earlier, it's the board that has a fiduciary duty to the association to make sure the required business gets done. So a board president will call the meeting to order, ask if there's any objection from the board members to having me or any other parliamentarian or professional presiding officer chair the meeting. And then we'll kind of take over from there. And it is easier for us to run a meeting, especially a homeowner's type of meeting, because we are impartial. We have no stake in the race. If you adopt a budget and you have a large maintenance fee increase or no maintenance fee increase, it makes no difference to how I operate because I'm not an owner there. So it's a little safer to have a non-owner run it because it, it makes me a much more impartial person. Also, especially if the board president and board members live on site, they do have to see these owners a lot. And so it's better to try to keep that relationship as friendly as possible. So it allows me to be more firm with people when it comes to sticking to time limits and telling people what they can and can't say during a formal meeting. And in fact, after our meeting, and our meeting went three hours when you were there in October, it went three hours. And, the, and, and there were owners in the audience who thanked you for being there, didn't they? Did that surprise they did. you? Um, they yelled at me in the beginning. Uh, but then once they saw that I was trying to be as fair as possible and give everyone that right to speak, because again, they don't have the right to vote on these items. However, they do have the right to provide their input within reasonable limits. So when they got the idea that I would allow them all to provide their input within these limits and that I would listen and I would take notes as to what they were saying, they seemed there was a mutual respect that was built. And I think that that was what helped them to thank me after the meeting. Yes. Did that surprise you when they did that? Um, you know, it didn't. I actually, I actually had a meeting earlier this week. Um, I had a meeting on, on Monday with a, a board that was online. And before I was, I was hired to run the meeting a few weeks back. And before I got there, the property manager told me, oh, there's a petition circulating amongst the owners to have you not chair the board meeting. And I said, wait, but they haven't even seen me yet. They don't even, they don't even know what it's going to be like yet. And so I went into the meeting knowing, okay, I have at least 25 owners that already hate me, even though they haven't met me. Um, so I'm kind of used to that. And I, I guess I am, I've become used to convincing people to slightly come over to my side. There'll be some people that it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter how fair I am. They're not going to be happy with me. But I would say that most owners, once they see again, that, that fairness, that respect, they grow to appreciate it. And so by the end of my Monday meeting, I had people thank me for being there. They said, of course, that they um, don't want to hire me for every board meeting because, again, they, they, we do charge for our services fairly, uh, which I understand. So I understand their point about not wanting to pay for it every time. But they did express their appreciation. So I would say usually I come away with 85 to 90 percent of owners appreciating that I was there. There will always be the couple that it doesn't matter. They're going to be upset regardless. Right. And and uh, and and uh, the the meeting did go long. I mean, so it wasn't like it was a a slam dunk and smooth sailing because we did have the owners, uh, you know, try to speak up, and they did. And and there were the same group, I guess, that you know uh, always spoke up on every issue. One thing that I suggest to boards, especially boards that I serve regularly, is I have a couple set of meeting rules that my father and I authored that provide for a little bit more stringent limits. So the meeting rules that I was functioning for your meeting, it had two and a half minutes per, regardless owner or um, board member, I believe, or at least that was for owners, mm -hmm. but it still allowed them the two speeches. Some board meeting rules will just allow two minutes per owner and or board member. And they are very specific, either two speeches or some will say board members get two speeches and owners only get one speech, especially if they have you know 20 to 30 owners that show up at every meeting because you wanna give everyone that, that chance to speak. But again, you also need to complete your business in a timely fashion. So I think board meeting rules help a bit. Another thing that helps is the meeting rules that I provide will also have time limits for reports. 
for discussion on reports and for when some motion is made. So that way it keeps business moving. The board, of course, can always vote to extend the limits. That's why I tell people. So the time limits are, are the base. But if it's something big that needs more discussion, like a budget, for example, then, of course, the board will usually vote to extend the time limits. And, you know, like with our budget, we had budget committee meetings. And, you know, the, the board got a copy of the draft budget. Let me see. We, we had our budget meeting on November 15th. I know they got their budget in September. So that means that board members actually had draft and, and they, because all the board members are members of the budget committee and not every one of the board members showed up for every one of the six budget committee meetings that we had that ran between two and three hours. We had six budget committee meetings and, and this, and owners were allowed to attend and participate. And so, you know, and, uh, uh, so, so we had six meetings uh, with several hours. They were provided with documents. They asked questions, and but yet, you know, our our meeting on approval of the budget, it went on. I think the the discussion went on for over an hour and a half. And I'm and 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 part of it was because you know the owners, the owners were, did they did everything possible to try to delay a vote. They tried to make motions to defer the vote, and uh, and and they tried to uh, make they tried to claim that the special meeting was invalid, and so we couldn't vote. Uh, you know, and and it, you know, so so I had to deal with that. You know, during this meeting, and I, I'm just wondering if and you know um, they they were arguing with us about the amount, even though we had all of those hours that we spent. And 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 they were told, and we we explained the budget. They all had copies of the budget, and uh, they, they and they all agreed that the inflation rate was somewhere between eight and nine percent. But that didn't that didn't uh, cover the insurance that all high rises right our insurance is up. You know, our, in in our uh, we got an estimate from our uh, adjuster, our our our, our representative. That it was going to go up eighteen to twenty percent, so that's above the eight and nine percent, right? And uh, so it was, and and that doesn't take care of our reserves. And then you know, and we we did talk about we and we had a brand new reserve study done for twenty twenty three, and I had to explain to people that the costs had changed because, you know, the costs went up after COVID, right? It went up and and. And since we had it done in the last two or three months, you know, that means that the higher interest rates were included in the cost. And we have supply chain problems that are increasing the cost. And, it, the, you know, and, and the cost of labor is going up. And yet, you know, there was, a, you know, there was a lot of pushback on how come we got to, you know, you know, uh, you know, sock away money for reserves. And I said, I, I reminded them, well, you look at Florida. Do you want your building to collapse? And if you're a board member, you're going to be personally liable if that money's not there to make repairs, because that's the main, you know, the board members have a fiduciary duty to repair and maintain the building, the facility, the project. And they got to make sure that the money is there for current owners and future owners so that it, the money is there and no special assessment. And I don't, I, I feel, you know, I felt like I was a broken record. I kept talking to people. And yet when we came down to the budget, people were talking about eight or 9% when the recommendation was 12%. And to me, that was too low because that did, that meant that we weren't putting away sufficient amounts for our reserves. I mean, it, 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 to me, it was just like an uphill battle. I mean, it was just really, really stressful this, this past week. And I, I don't know how, I mean, I don't know how we can explain that to owners uh, without having a disruptive meeting. Yeah, nobody wants to pay more money. I get that. I get that. But the problem is, is that, you know, you, you have 20 people out in the uh, audience, you know, and, and, you know, they're raising their voices and they're yelling. It scares the board, you know, and, and that's my concern. And, and, and so it, it intimidates them. Because we all have to live in the same building, right? 
and you have these 20 people that know who you are, you know who they, who they are, and they're saying, don't, basically, don't raise the maintenance fees, because if you do, we're going to hate you, right? That's the message you get from these people who show up at the meetings. I feel that sometimes owners forget that board members are owners too. And you're yeah. right. We don't want to pay higher maintenance fees. Your insurance premium increase is actually lower than a number of the other condos that I serve in than my own condo. I've seen 40 to 50% increases in yeah. insurance premiums and great increases to the deductible. Uh, the deductible used to be maybe around five to 10,000. Now a lot of deductibles are between 50 and a hundred thousand. Yeah, ours is 50. So ours is 50. That's, that's why we have, that's why a couple of years ago, we adopted that insurance thing where, where all the owners have to have a, a, a HO6 policy. And, and if they don't have one, the uh, association buys one. We force place it, right? We, we, and then we charge them for it. But that's yeah. why, because we have a $50,000 deductible because of all of our water leak claims. Yep. But, yeah, you know, exactly. and, and, and I keep telling people, you know, that we because of the Florida collapse, that the government, the legislatures are looking at ways to try to prevent that, even though we have one of the strongest reserve laws, budget and reserve laws in the country. You know, e even though we have such a strong, it, it's voluntary, right? If the boards don't comply with the budget and reserve law, it makes no difference if we've got the strongest, you know, the statute in the country because it depends on whether or not the boards are going to comply with that. And and right now, I mean, the minimum amount you're supposed to have is 50% of the replacement value of your of all of your re reserve items. And I know a lot of boards do not. Mine doesn't. We don't have 50% in our reserve study, I mean, our, in our reserve accounts. And, you know, that's, and I guess that's hard for people to visualize. You know, like the building seems to be fine. We don't seem to have cracks, you know, so. So what you can't see, you're not going to worry about. Right? So why do we have to sock away money? You know, I, it, it's it's hard, I guess, for them to see that we need to raise the maintenance fees, you know, uh, in, in an amount above the inflation rate or above the amount that's going to pay just for operating costs. Because otherwise, if we don't sock away the additional money, we're not going to have money to pay for repairs in the future. And what we do know is that the repairs in the future are going to be more expensive. We do know yeah. that. And with older buildings, the, 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 you know, the, the, the repairs that we have to do are huge because you're basically redoing your building. You got to do small work. That's a million dollars. You got to replace your pipes. That's like this. Yeah, several million dollars. You know, so so nothing is hundreds of thousands. I mean, that was old time, right? Now everything's got a million in front of it. Yeah. Right. And a lot of and, us don't have millions of dollars in our reserve uh accounts. And that's the scary thing. If we have to, you know, address these 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 problems, that means we're going and I and I tell I to, I told my board, if we have to do a special assessment, that means we screwed up. Because you can only do a special assessment if you can show that you didn't know. And I mean, we've had all these discussions about the reserve. We have a reserve study that says that we're only 14% funded when we should be 50% funded. And the reserve uh, report says, and this is a weak financial position. And they've and the, my board members have been told that, you know, the banks can come and look at your reserve study. And they do. Right. If you want to get a loan or if somebody in the building wants to get a loan, they want to look at the reserve study and 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 maybe you're not going to get that loan because we have we don't have enough money set aside for reserves. And why would the bank lend money if you don't have enough uh, money set aside for reserves and that some that something catastrophic happens and then the borrower may not be able to pay back the lender. Right. The lender sees. Ah. They've got a weak financial position. Why would I want to lend the association money or anybody who wants to buy into it or even a unit owner who wants to do, you know, use the uh, condo, you know, for collateral? I mean, they won't be able to, you know, get a loan because, you know, the, 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 the association's finances aren't in good shape. And, you know, we yeah. might have, you know, enough money in our bank accounts for our operating, 
but we don't have enough in our reserves. That's what they don't understand. Yeah. I think what a lot of people don't realize too is the Marco Polo fire really hurt a lot of us because then a lot of us who were built before 1975, my building is 1974, all of a sudden they're like, oh, now you need to install sprinklers. And if you don't install sprinklers, if you get enough owners to agree to not put in sprinklers, you still have to do hundreds of thousands of dollars of improvements to meet the these fire life safety standards that they created. Right. So sure. that also increased the amount necessary for reserves. And all of those come together to make some angry owners, which is right. understandable. Right. But we still we still have to take care of the building. And that's what the, I don't think that's what the owners understand. They don't understand that the board and I told the board, it's not easy. And you guys have got hard decisions to make. I'm not going to deny it. And you're going to make some people angry. You know, that's a given because they don't want to pay more money. But the but the facts are, is that, you know, right now we're kind of stuck. And we have the, the, the thing about, the, you know, the fire sprinklers. Uh, hovering over our heads because we have an opt-out resolution that we're circulating and we're not close to 50%. So if we don't get to 50%, we got to do sprinklers, you know? And, 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 and the good thing is that the city, I think they just passed a resolution that kind of makes a life safety uh, ordinance maybe on shaky grounds because yeah, that- kind of pushed it off to the future more, which is helpful right. for us to plan because now we can start keep slowly building the reserves to try to catch up you know right and and because because they they were it was brought that you know we we testified at the city council hearing to say you know back in 2018 when we were talking about this ordinance there was no worldwide pandemic and then there was no business closures there was no supply chain problem you know there was no increase in you know in insurance rate because the reinsurance market hit tanks you know, right. now all of those things are affecting us and the deadlines in the fire safety ordinance are undoable. Nobody can comply. And and and, and the city is at the, 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 the bottom of it because there's 255 buildings in Honolulu that have not gotten passing scores on the LSE. They need building permits. And there's no way the city's gonna be able to give us building permits. And so there's, so how can you make us comply with the law that we can't even, you know, get the building permit so that we can comply with the law. I mean, it's it's circular, and so I think they finally recognize that. Hey, this is not going to work. We got to go back to the plan. You know, so so everything is on hold, and so you know, this is a good thing. But you know, I'm 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 just saying that you know, those of us who are in the know, uh, we we're kind of living with the fact that you know we've got all these issues. What the owners don't understand is that they're putting the board in really bad position and you know when they disrupt meetings it's not like they're going to win battles and in fact in my at my condo our my board adopted the 12 percent after a long meeting you know so in the end they failed you know, they they failed to stop the vote they failed to stop the increase and and i i'm hearing all over the state that the increases are going you know from anywhere from uh, 14 to 20 percent and higher right because of all the factors that we all that has nothing to do with the individual buildings and associations it's not that we are doing something wrong it just means that the economy is not in a good place and all and the buildings are old right and it takes more money to repair and maintain them and somebody's got to pay for them and unfortunately that's the owners they say no matter what, you should be raising maintenance fees two to four percent every year just to account for inflation. Yeah. So every year it should go up. It's just a lot of us don't like to make it go up every year. So maybe we'll wait a couple of years and then do a slightly larger jump. But yeah, but I think after floor after the Florida condo collapse, now the now the government is gonna step in. And next thing you know, we're gonna have building envelope in, in, you know, inspections, which is more costly. But anyway, I do digress and I, you know, we run out of time and I want to thank you, Rachel, for saving, for being our savior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and, I, and, and, and I hope the word gets out to all of you people who are uh, watching and listening to the show uh, that if you have disorder 
uh, in your board meetings that there is a uh, there is um, a light at the end of the tunnel. You can call a parliamentarian to come in and bring order to your disorder. And I I, I will attest to the fact that it works. We we got through our October meeting and and we got our budget and I followed Rachel's advice and we got our budget approved uh, this past week. And hopefully our November meeting goes is is uneventful. Let's and make it that, short too. The goal is right. one to two hours top. So right. and you know, so 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 I, I urge you if if you have uh, you know if you have disorder, you know, contact Rachel. Oh, how how do they get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you? Uh so the best way is by email, um, either rglanstein at gmail.com, that's me. Or my father, we work together. He's Steve G. High at gmail.com. Or you can give our office a call, 808 423 6766. Again, that's 808 423 6766. Thanks, Jane. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. And 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 thank you for being, you know, on our guest uh on our show. Um, I you know, I, I'm I'm just so grateful, you know, for your assistance and helping my association get through their disruption. And uh, and so I hope that, you know, th those associations out there who are having disruptive meetings, you know, you, you consider how, uh, hiring a parliamentarian. And, you know, thank you for joining us today uh, for our show. And um, please join us uh, next week for another interesting uh, show on uh, people who live and work in condominiums. Uh, so I hope you do join us uh, for another episode of Condo Insider. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.